All righty, the webinar is now live. All right, good evening. We'll be getting started in just a few minutes. Okay, good evening and welcome to the Transition Master Plan virtual meeting. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Caitlin Schenkel. I am a transportation planner with the City of Sydney Springs. Um, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about our Transition Master Plan, which really is establishes a list of recommendations for future transportation related projects and policies. And so we're going to discuss how we kind of developed our, our draft list and then also give a demonstration of how to provide public feedback on, on our list. Next slide. And before we get into all that, I do have a few housekeeping items. I wanted to mention that all attendees are in listen only mode. So you can hear us, but we can't hear you. If you have any questions or have any technical issues, you can communicate with us through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We are keeping this presentation to one hour today. So if there's any questions that we aren't able to get to, we'll, we will follow up with you um, afterwards. This presentation will be recorded and posted on the city's website. Our presentation today will be in English, but if you want to speak with us in Spanish about the projects or any of the presentation material, please reach out to us at tmp at sandyspringsga.gov and we'll get back to you in Spanish. And with that, I'll hand it over to our consultant team, Jessica Choi with Kimley Horn. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for choosing to spend it with us today. Uh, we have some exciting content to tell you about it regarding the transportation master plan um, and um, a lot of ways that you can give us some feedback on where we are today. So uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started on the slides. A quick overview of our agenda tonight. Uh, we have four bullets here. One, we're going to give you an, uh, an update on where we are with the project, where we have been since the last time we had a public meeting. The second bullet, we're going to give you an overview of what we've done in terms of technical analysis. Um, this is really the foundation of our project development and kind of where we are with the draft projects. So we wanted to share a little bit of that information with you tonight as well. Like what Caitlin mentioned, um, a lot of our meeting today is based on the proposed projects and policies for the for the TMP. And again, you know, with that, we're going to show you a, a really great way for you to be able to give us some online feedback. And we'll be walking through a live demonstration of that tool. So the slide in front of you, you know, really this is our um, our planning process and our schedule since the beginning of the transportation master plan. We started back in February of 2020, and and a lot has happened. Um, but we're really excited to come back to you all uh, virtually, um, given COVID. But back to you all to gather feedback again. Uh, you'll see, you know, we had our last meeting in June of 2020, and we've done quite a bit of work since then, uh, specifically regarding the multimodal needs assessment, which we'll explain in just a little bit. Um, as well as project development for the TMP. Um, in, if you look towards the end of the timeline, you can see that we are looking to finalize the plan in April of 2021, so just a couple of months away. 
Our planning process is simplified here in this graphic to step through what we've completed to date. Our last public meeting again in June uh, gave us a really great idea of where Sandy Springs is today and where the public, where you all envision the city uh, to move towards for its transportation future. We got a lot of comments from y'all about specific improvements regarding pedestrian, bicycling, uh, transit and roadway improvements. And we really took your input from the last round of public meetings into the technical assessment of this plan to really get to where we are today. The green arrow that you're seeing in the flow chart up here, this is um, describing where we are today again, as we have developed a draft list of projects for you all to consider. Now, before we go um, go forward, I just want to send a quick reminder that if you do have questions, uh, please uh, communicate that uh, to us through the Q&A box. We'll be answering the questions at specific breaks along the presentation. Now, the multimodal needs assessment um, consisted of several different evaluations that were done across all different modes in Sandy Springs. We've listed the different evaluations here, and we'll be reviewing major takeaways and the purpose of each memo. And when you put all that, all this together, all the technical evaluation, all the assessments, it really gave us and the TMP a truly comprehensive look at the different modes and served as a basis, the technical basis to our draft project list. I do wanna mention here that the safety evaluation that you're seeing in that bullet was not only just a citywide assessment, but also a hotspot analysis of five specific locations. Um, I'm not gonna give away too much because I'm actually gonna ask my colleague, Jordan Fuga, to step on video and walk you through some of our findings. Jordan? All right, next slide, please. All right, hey everyone. Um, so the first effort from the multimodal needs assessment that we're going to discuss is our travel demand forecasting model. And that's a tool that we use to better understand existing travel patterns and how those patterns and subsequent traffic volumes are likely to change in the future based on a variety of things, um, infrastructure projects, socioeconomic data. Um, for example, if we have a new roadway project or an interchange project planned, um, even a roadway capacity project, um, or if we're projecting into the future and we anticipate some parts of the city to add a lot of extra housing and other parts to add a lot of jobs, um, then we can use that. That tells us a lot about where trips in Sandy Springs end and, be end and begin. And the model helps us understand the routing between where those trips um, are going. So the model is really an effective comparison tool and it helps us forecast future traffic conditions. Um, what you see here is an output of our model we built it from the Atlanta Regional Commission's region-wide model, um, but then we went and refined it to the city of Sandy Springs um, to make it a little more accurate and a little more detailed. Um, and so that was our base 2018 model. Um, from there, we built a 2050 model to project what traffic might look like in 2050. Um, so all of those calibration edits that we made to the Atlanta region's model to make it a little more Sandy Springs specific, um, we applied those to the future and then also included any planned projects um, and then projections in population and employment um, so that we could make some reasonable, um, reasonable assumptions about what the future is gonna look like. Um, so our higher volume roadways in 2018 ended up being our higher volume roadways in 2050, which is to be expected, um, but it also helps us identify our higher need areas as part of this assessment. Um, the highest increases that we saw were in Western Sandy Springs, particularly along Northside Drive, Powers Ferry Road, and Mount Vernon Highway. Um, those areas in Eastern Sandy Springs, um, where we saw the highest increases in traffic volumes, um, were around State Road 400, particularly Mount Vernon Highway, Barfield Road, and Glen Ridge Drive. Next slide, please. Um, so looking at volumes alone isn't a totally fair way to analyze um, traffic and traffic projections on our roadway network. And that's because a lot of roadways are higher volume because they're larger and designed to carry larger traffic volumes. Um, so that's why we look at something that's called volume to capacity ratio. And um, that gives us an idea of what traffic congestion will look like and quality of service. Um, and that metric just compares a roadway's traffic volume against what it's designed to carry. Um, so similar to the previous map we saw, the hotspot areas where volumes increase the most are those areas where we see volume to capacity ratio worsen in 2050. Um, one interesting thing that we didn't necessarily expect 
um, was um, over in the North Side Drive area near I-285. Um, we see a lot more travel activity over there, um, and it's likely due to um, planned increased capacity on I-285. Um, so we're seeing more travel over there because of that. Um, but then other parts of the city, we see improvements from that additional capacity on I-285, um, like over on Hammond Drive. Next slide, please. So the next task um, in the multimodal needs assessment was a traffic operations evaluation. Uh, evaluation. So when you're doing a citywide transportation plan, it can be difficult to get detailed at an intersection level, um, just because there are so many intersections. Um, so you'll typically see us look at corridors or the larger roadway network. Um, but as part of this master plan, we wanted to dive into 20 specific intersections a little more in depth, um, which you can see those 20 intersections on the map. Um, at these locations, we reviewed traffic volumes and five-year crash histories. Um, we got our boots on the ground and did um, intersection visits and field audits um, so that we could put our eyes on how things are operating and what they look like. Um, then we did intersection capacity analyses, um, which basically means we um, ran models to quantify what delay looks like for drivers who are driving through these intersections. Um, so we looked at 2018 traffic conditions as well as what we projected for 2050. Um, and looking at both of these years helps us um, better understand short-term and long-term needs for these areas. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so based on those needs that we identified at each intersection, we were able to make several improvement recommendations, um, such as repaving and restriping um, or improving signal equipment, like adding back plates with retroreflective borders, um, signal heads, upgrading left turn signal heads to flashing yellow arrows, those types of things. Um, we're in a position right now where the city has completed a lot of roadway and intersection improvement projects pretty recently. So some of these recommendations um, that ended up on our project list, they seem more modest in comparison to other projects. Um, but really, a lot of these are some of the lower cost, lower effort projects that actually have pretty decent impacts on both safety and operations. Um, so it allows us to use this plan to address some of the more immediate needs that the city has um, while we're also programming for further into the future. So while some of the larger projects didn't come from this analysis, the real power of this analysis was that we were able to take a finer and more detailed look at several specific locations. Uh, next slide, please. So our next task um, was a safety evaluation, which Jessica mentioned was actually two different evaluations. Um, we performed a safety analysis for the city as well. Um, and then we also um, picked five intersections in which we looked a little more in detail um, and did in-depth analyses of those five intersections. So this map is from our citywide analysis and it highlights high crash corridors. Um, and we looked at several, we looked at the crash data in several ways. Um, one was the overall crashes, just to get an idea of the areas where a lot of the crashes are happening. Um, and then we also looked at crashes per mile, um, which helps us identify hot spots. Um, where there are a dispro disproportionate amount of crashes happening. Um, so when you look at crashes per mile, it makes sense um, that longer corridors might have more crashes. Um, we also looked at a thing called crash rate, which takes the length of a segment into consideration as well as traffic volumes. Because again, it makes sense that a roadway that has more traffic volumes would have more crashes. Um, but looking at it at a rate helps us um, have a comparison tool between smaller roadways and larger roadways. Um, so based off of these three metrics, Roswell Road, Northridge Road, Dunwoody Place, and Hammond Drive stood out as some of our high need corridors. Next slide, please. This next map depicts our fatal and serious injury crashes overlaid on crash concentrations throughout the city. Um, while it's important to understand all crash trends and aim to reduce overall crash frequency, Addressing serious injury and fatal crashes um, can have a lot of meaningful impact. First, um, that's what's going to save lives on our roadways. Um, but then next, once we address some of those more severe crash types, um, that has really meaningful impacts, um, economic benefit, um, congestion benefit. Um, there's a lot of benefit that comes to addressing the more severe crash types. Um, and this analysis is also how we identified the five um, specific locations that we studied more in depth. Um, which you can see as well. Um, so we dug into the crash histories at these locations and identified a range of safety improvements. Um, 
some that were lower cost, higher impact countermeasures to, to others that were longer term, larger projects. Um, for example, so if you look at the last two intersections that we have on the slide, um, you'll notice that they're actually two intersection nodes of a single interchange. So at an immediate intersection level, um, we noted that they both have significant rear end and left turn crash trends. Um, so we were able to identify signal timing, signal equipment, and signing improvements in the short term. Um, but then also looking further into the future, um, these two intersections are tied together operationally. Um, so with the operational and safety issues that we have at this location, um, one of our longer term um, projects was to construct an innovative interchange at this location. Next slide, please. So as part of the safety evaluation, we analyzed the city's crash history to emphasis areas. Um, which these are um, these areas are defined by the state of Georgia in the strategic highway safety plan um, and an emphasis area is basically just a way of identifying the top contributing or the top factors that contribute to crashes in Georgia. Um, they have 11 different um, emphasis areas um, and at the state level, they put a lot of research into how we can address crash trends that are related to these emphasis areas. Um, but at the local level, identifying the emphasis areas that are tied to our crash trends, um, it allows us to focus our efforts on emerging safety trends in our community and identify the appropriate effective countermeasures for our community. Um, so the top five emphasis areas that emerge for Sandy Springs, listed in order, are intersection related crashes, distracted driving, um, and you'll notice we have two categories of older drivers. Um, so there are three different like age groups that are focus areas in the strategic highway safety plan. You have younger drivers as well as two categories of older drivers. Um, and that's just because um, individuals 55 and older can have um, similar susceptibilities to certain crash types. Um, the reason they're broken up into two group is while, um, while that susceptibility is the same, we see a sharp increase um, in crashes for 65 and older. So they break them out that way just to analyze it a little more. Um, and then our fifth emphasis area in Sandy Springs was hit and run crashes. Um, so other examples of other emphasis areas in the strategic highway safety plan um, involve commercial motor vehicle crashes, aggressive driving, impaired driving, motorcycle crashes, pedestrians, bicycles. Um, and really they're just focus areas that research goes into so that we can address um, specific crash trends in specific locations. Um, so understanding these emphasis areas allows us to tailor our approach to roadway safety um, to the needs of Sandy Springs, which brings us to the six E's of transportation safety, um, which are education, enforcement, encouragement, engineering, evaluation, and emergency response. And basically what this is getting at is that transportation safety is just so much more than the infrastructure improvements that we as planners and engineers identify. It's really a team effort that involves the entire community. So education is educating everyone on transportation safety, getting the word out about safe driving behaviors. Enforcement. So there's a lot that we can do from an engineering and policy standpoint that impacts traffic safety, but a lot of those efforts are only successful with strong enforcement. Um, third is encouragement. This is about making a culture change where we're in a community that encourages safe transportation decisions and behaviors. Um, engineering. That's what we can do to make the built environment safer. Evaluation. That's just taking a step back and looking at the work we've done, looking at our data trends, evaluating their effectiveness, and then tailoring our efforts moving forward to what works and what doesn't work for our community. Um, and then lastly is emergency response. And that's working with emergency responders to understand their needs and perspectives so that when incidents do happen, we have an appropriate emergency response plan in place. So taking this more holistic and systemic approach to transportation safety, really is the strongest way for Sandy Springs to have a big impact on transportation safety in the community. Um, and with that, I will pass it back to Jessica to discuss multimodal connectivity. Thanks, Jordan. I'm actually gonna take a pause really quickly because we have a couple of questions. I'm gonna ask Caitlin um, if you can come back on video. Um, so the first question that we received was from Carolyn. Um, she asked, when you look at intersections, did you take into consideration uh, the properties in the north end? Caitlin, do you want to talk a little bit about the north end and, and, and what that looks like? Yes. So I'd say when we're, we're choosing the intersections uh, for the analysis, for the operations analysis, we really focused in on 
safety locations, so where we're seeing some crashes, as well as some locations that haven't been studied from an operational standpoint in a while. And so that kind of what drove the locations we looked at in more detail. Um, in terms of Jordan's uh, modeling that she spoke about, uh, that takes into account future development based on zoning. And so based off of the next 10 and the, and the zoning recommendations for those areas, that kind of influences how, how things could impact population and, um, and job growth. And so that would impact traffic volumes. And so that was taken into consideration in, in that way. And I will also add that we are doing a North End safety study in a few months. And so, uh, which we can incorporate those findings into the plan um, as we, after we finalize it. So um, there are different ways that we are incorporating the North End. Great, thank you, Caitlin. Um, there is another question regarding Roswell Road. Um, uh, Jeff is asking, you would think that there was a lot of crashes on Roswell Road between 285 and Hammond Drive, and he did not see that on the list. Um, Jordan, do you wanna talk a little bit about the overall assessment that we conducted before we drilled down to the five? Yes, um, so actually that area does have a lot of crashes and um, the city has recognized that there are a lot of crashes on Roswell Road. So they've had several safety study efforts um, looking at those areas. So when we were picking the five intersections that we went in depth with, um, we wanted to make sure that we weren't duplicating any other study efforts in the city. So if you know a previous study had been conducted there recently or if the city was planning to look at that area, um, we wanted to be con conscious of that so that we were using resources wisely and not duplicating work. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, there's a third question from Nancy. Um, Nancy asks, have you looked at the intersection of Long Island and Mount Vernon at the cemetery? Okay. I'll take that one, Jessica. So that was okay. not part of the study, but that is something that the city is looking at separately. All right, uh, right uh, before we go on, there's one more question. Um, I live right by Roswell and 285. Um, this person said that they've been hit as a pedestrian by vehicles and uh, there's some issues regarding lighting uh, or lack of sidewalk or lack of awareness. Will these be addressed in your study? And actually we're gonna be talking a little bit about bicycling and walking in just a little bit. So um, hopefully we can answer some of those questions. And I'll, and I'll pause because that's actually one of the locations that we do have a recommendation. Um, Jordan, do you wanna speak a little bit to I-285 ramps and Russell Road since that was part of our, our five intersections we looked at in more detail? Yeah, and I don't have the project list directly in front of me, but um, yeah, since those were two of our intersections, we did go through and unfortunately, like the operational evaluation, we didn't get to do the site visit like we um, for the safety analysis, um, but we did look at aerial photography and do street view. And then we did notice a lack of that connectivity and those sorts of things. Um, so I think a lot of the infrastructure issues are being addressed. Um, I do know at that area, there was a disproportionate amount of dark crashes. Um, so we did recommend a lighting evaluation there to bring that up to a safer condition. Um, and then for the lack of awareness, I think that goes back to the E um, for education as well. Thanks, Jordan. We have a couple more questions coming in. Um, there was a question about, are the top five areas of safety concern listed in order? And this is from Colin. And, and yes, Colin, these are the top five um, emphasis areas that were identified as a part of the citywide assessment. All right, and Jessica, I see we have a few more questions coming in, but let's pause on questions for now. And we'll let them trickle in as we go through the rest of the presentation and get to them towards the end of the, the, the presentation. Sounds great. But thank you all, all for the good questions. <laughs> All right, we're gonna go into bicycling and walking. Uh, for the bicycling and walking assessment, we looked at not only the city's transportation network, but also the suitability of Sandy Springs streets for cyclists and pedestrians. And so one of the analyses that we conducted was a level of stress test. Uh, we're calling this LTS as you're seeing on the screen which was conducted to identify streets where most cyclists would feel comfortable. And so the LTS analysis in, um, includes considerations for things like traffic volumes, the number of travel lanes, and speed limits. 
The LTS categories really range from LTS one, which suggests that streets are suitable for bicycling by all, um, all types of bicyclists um, for all ages, all abilities to LTS four which suggests that streets are most suitable for those who are more ex most experienced and confident. And so obviously the streets classified as LTS1 typically have lower volumes, fewer through lanes um, and lower speed limits. And you're seeing a lot of the major roadways in Sandy Springs in that red color, which is categorized as LTS4. Now, I will mention, you know, this is just one of the several tools that we used um, in order to determine the actual facilities that were recommended. And in this case, this tool tells us that many of the city's primary and secondary street network is really only suitable for those who um, are the most experienced and most confident of riders. Um, and that if, um, if we were to provide a, 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 a facility, something that might be more suitable in this case might be a side path um, that's completely separated from the roadway. So um, just, a, just a tool in the, um, the tool belt. Now, complementary to this, we conducted an analysis called the 20 minute neighborhood analysis. Now, the idea of a 20 minute neighborhood um, looks at giving the ability to people to meet most of their everyday needs through a 20 minute walk, cycle, or a transit trip. Now, the concept contains a lot of benefits, such as higher levels of physical activity, more focus on connections to local businesses and resources, and even potentially some less congestion on our roadways due to less demand for using your, you know, your car for short trips. Now, the list of 12 activity centers that you're seeing here uh, were largely selected for centers that had features consistent with a 20 minute neighborhood. So elements like having multiple uses, shopping, employment, um, health facilities, or even local public transportation options. And so this analysis specifically looked at how far someone could walk within 20 minutes from each of these 12 activity centers, which ends up being actually about a mile. So um, there was a question earlier about uh, sidewalk gaps and sidewalk infrastructure, and this is actually one of the methods that we used in order to identify some of these gaps, larger gaps in the, in, in the network, as well as some major roadways that needed a, a really kind of a closer look for bicycle and pedestrian improvements. So those were the two, um, two tools that we really used to, to drive some of the bicycling and walking recommendations. Um, we also conducted a transit network analysis as a part of the TMP. Um, understanding that the city is not a transit operator, we really focused on three specific areas. So the first was, how do we better those last mile connections to transit stops and stations? The second was, you know, what are, what are the ways that we can improve local circulation within the city? And then the third was, okay, so let's, let's understand a little bit more about the city um, and its connections to adjacent jurisdictions and what, what, tra what, what role um, transit plays in that. And so um, one of the, one, I'm gonna share with you actually a snapshot of findings. Um, and so the first is directly correlated to the map that you're seeing on the screen. So we found that the highest concentrations of people accessing MARTA rail stations actually come from right nearby each of the stations. So you're seeing again, the darker green concentration showing up closer to each of the MARTA rail stations. Now, based on the MARTA rail station, we found that the share of people driving versus using other modes shifts pretty dramatically. And so if you see the North Spring Station, about 37% of folks who are accessing the North Spring Station to take MARTA elsewhere um, actually drive and park at the station versus compare, when we compare it to Dunwoody or medical center stations, there's less than 10% of the people who are trying to access MARTA rail who are driving. And so there's a lot of connectivity and pedestrian and cycling things that we start to think about when we start to see the breakdown of numbers like that. Now, like I mentioned, uh, the city of Sandy Springs is not a transit operator. And so there, um, there's not as much that the city can do when it comes to specifically operating the transit service, but there are things that the city can do to help to move transit forward. 
Now, we had two key takeaways from this transit network analysis. The first is for the city to prepare for future regional transit. Um, some of you may know there have been some previous plans that have identified regional transit projects that will likely um, involve the city of Sandy Springs. And as a part of the TMP, we've identified ways for the city to better, um, you know, better connect to those future opportunities, as well as ways for the city to remain really, part, um, you know, heavily part. A heavy, a heavy participant, excuse me, um, in the regional transit discussions. The second big takeaway was that, you know, there are a lot of Sandy Springs employees and residents who are using MARTA bus and MARTA rail services for everyday needs, uh, for work, to get groceries, et cetera. And for MARTA buses specifically, we identified some ways that the city can really um, leverage its existing infrastructure to help buses travel more efficiently within the city. And one of the ways that the city can do that is by implementing what's called transit signal priority or TSP along key bus corridors. And what TSP really is, and I'm simplifying this a little bit, but really it's a modification of traffic signal timing in order to allow transit vehicles priority travel and then reduce the delay that the buses experience at intersections. And so I want to I also want to uh, point out the second bullet here, uh, you know, complementary to TSP and helping the buses move along on city streets. Um, we are also um, recommending some last mile connections to help to reduce the distance and the barrier for folks to walk and cycle to transit facilities. So lots of connections here, not only from transit, but how people get to and from um, transit in, in the city. All right, uh, before I proceed, I'm gonna check if there are any questions. It looks like we don't have any questions um, at the moment, so I'm gonna keep going here. Um, so we're gonna actually um, show you some draft. Hey, Jessica? Uh, oh, yes, Caitlin. We do have two questions. <laughs> oh, you are right. All right, um, there is a comment regarding driveway cuts into sidewalks. Um, and I'm not sure specifically which corridor is being referenced I think that was here. Roswell Road. Got it. Okay. All right. Uh, Caitlin, do you want to talk a little bit about the Roswell Road uh, kind of things that you got y'all are working on in, in that, that city? Yeah, there, there are a couple of projects that are underway for Roswell Road and, and um, plan parks as well. Um, so I, I think the city understands that there are a lot of cur driver curb cuts um, that have been around for, for years. And so uh, through the city's development code, we are trying to reduce that going forward, but uh, we do understand that it is not an ideal situation. All right, our second uh, question that was submitted was from Ruthie. Um, Ruthie said, I, I think that rather than focusing mainly on older drivers, you may want to look at younger drivers um, racing in the neighborhoods. Uh, Jordan, do you want to talk a little bit about um, some of the age distinctions in the emphasis areas um, and just other kind of cohorts that were in there? Yeah, so younger drivers is definitely also um, an emphasis area and um, younger driver crashes did um, did frequently pop up when we were reviewing data for the city. Um, having they're all emphasis areas, so they all get their own attention for different reasons. Um, a lot of the things that we see with older drivers are very different from what we see with younger drivers, because you're right. Um, the issues that we have for that emphasis area are typically coming to distracted driving and poor driving decisions like speeding through neighborhoods. Um, so the types of like research and countermeasures and projects that go that are geared towards younger drivers are different than uh, the types of things we would do to other age groups. Um, so they're all emphasis areas, um, and we recognize your concern that younger drivers can um, can make some unsafe decisions while driving. Thank you, Jordan. All right, I'm not seeing anything else on my screen for questions. I do want to make one clarification. So, um, in the model slides that Jordan shared. Um, in the 2050 model, ARC has programmed in the Hammond Drive capacity project. And so it takes into consideration that we are widening the road in the future. And so that's why the level of service does not look as poor in the future as it does um, in the 2018 model, because it does assume there is a widening in the, in the future.
Thank you, Caitlin. All right, uh, we're gonna actually go ahead and proceed with our slides now. Um, so the first thing that we wanted to show you all um, is the prioritization criteria that we used um, to really evaluate the project list. And so um, if you attended our last public meeting, these may look familiar. Uh, the top six really are the goals that we asked you all to help us to prioritize at the time. And based on public feedback, we assigned points for each of these and created metrics to evaluate the draft list of projects. So things like safety, mobility and accessibility, economic vitality, um, et cetera. Based on the evaluation, we were able to put together a draft list of projects for consideration. Um, these projects include four major categories, roadway, intelligent transportation systems, bicycle, pedestrian, and trails, as well as transit. Now, the projects themselves span across the entire city. You can see the map here on the right. And we won't be going through each one of these um, in, in specificity for this presentation, but again, we mentioned that we do have an online feedback tool that you'll be able to give us some direct feedback about these projects. Um, but I will be going through the different uh, major categories as well as the specific uh, project types that have been included in each. Uh, the first category is roadway projects. And so the first uh, bullet that you see there is intersections. And you heard Jordan talk a lot about that today. Uh, we have two specific types of projects that are broken out here. The first is a mid-block crossing. And mid-block crossings are essentially uh, signalizing intersections for pedestrians and cyclists to be able to safely cross the road. Um, these mid-block crossings have been identified for areas where there's a high level of pedestrian activity, lots of people walking, as well as long distances between signals. Uh, the second bullet under intersection, you'll see, again, these are, again, more traditional uh, safety and operational improvements. Uh, these are mainly focused on vehicular access, but we do and we have considered safety and operational improvements for, um, for pedestrians as well. The second big uh, project type here is bridge, and this includes the upgrading, the repair, or the uh, or reconstruction of bridges to bring them to standard, as well as some multimodal and aesthetic enhancements that, um, that we would be looking at to implement. Uh, the third and fourth uh, roadway project types here are capacity and corridor. So capacity includes the widening of a roadway to address high volume and congested corridors. And then corridor projects include, uh, these are actually non-widening projects, so they don't widen the road. And these include access management improvements, complete streets improvements, as well as corridor studies. Under bicycle, bicycle, pedestrian, and trail projects. Um, so bicycle, pedestrian facilities, this, these largely include separated bicycle and or uh, pedestrian paths along the roadway. So not traveling with the vehicles, but in a separate facility. We also have trail studies uh, to really look at off-road facilities. And then um, you'll see sidewalk program here. And these are sidewalks along, um, along roadways in Sandy Springs. Um, and you'll see that this is treated a little bit differently in terms that in, um, you know, we have to keep in mind that the city already has an evaluation process that they use on an annual basis. But you'll be able to see the, the specific sidewalk segments that have been recommended as a part of this. Um, the two project types that you're seeing here are Intelligent Transportation Systems, or ITS. Uh, these projects are not mapped on the online feedback tool, but are largely driven through the Sandy Springs ITS Master Plan that was completed back in March. And here we're really looking to build out the fiber optic cable network to really ensure that communications to signals and cameras and other devices that really help to keep, um, you know, keep traffic moving in the city are maintained and improved. The transit projects, again, we mentioned this earlier during the transit slides, um, but the city is not a transit operator, but we have identified some ways that buses can help to move a little bit more smooth, smoothly in the city through TSP, as well as some studies uh, for regional bus rapid transit. And these are the regional transit opportunities I talked about um, a little bit ago and how those cities transportation network will continue to connect to them. We also have four policies that are included in the draft 
recommendations. Um, if you remember, Jordan mentioned the six E's of safety just a little while ago. Uh, the first bullet that you're seeing here is the zero deaths and safety systems policy, uh, safe systems policy, excuse me, um, which is an initiative out of the Federal Highway Administration that really looks for ways that we can lower the number of serious crashes that result in injuries or fatalities. And so this isn't just a policy that looks to better engineering and design, but one that really looks for ways that we can better education, emergency response, you know, we're really looking for a holistic approach here for improving our transportation network. The second bullet is complete streets and complete streets is a transportation policy and design approach that really looks for streets to be planned, designed, operated and maintained to enable safe and comfortable travel for people of all ages, all modes and all abilities. Now the city has been working towards this and is actively thinking about it, um, about complete streets, especially through the next 10 comprehensive plan effort, but has not formalized it into policy. And so that's been included, um, the complete streets policy um, has been included as a recommendation. Micromobility policy. This is the third bullet that you're seeing here. Now, um, y'all may know this, but micromobility refers to lightweight vehicles that people drive personally. So things like the e-scooters, the bird scooters that you maybe ha may have seen in Metro Atlanta. Now, although micromobility is not playing a significant role in the city's transportation network today, we do anticipate that with good infrastructure and investment could come a potential increase in these types of devices in the city. And as, um, as we've kind of said through the presentation, you know, we want to be able to be preventative of any challenges rather than reactive. So this is something that we've, uh, we've included again as um, in the draft policy recommendations. The last bullet here is regarding ride sharing services, um, such as Uber and Lyft. Again, similar to micromobility, ride sharing hasn't played a significant role in the city just yet, um, but we do, we have recommended for the city to keep, um, you know, ride sharing Uber, Lyft um, on the radar and really consider policies such as curb management and, and, and similar uh, policies to really manage any uh, potential congestion issues. All right, um, and the next uh, couple slides here, we're actually gonna um, go through the online feedback tool to show you all uh, how to step through it. Um, you'll see the link here, the online feedback tool. This is the short link that'll get, direct you straight to the website. Um, and we do wanna note here that the maps do not include current city transportations that are moving forward. And if you do have questions regarding those to email the TMP um, email address, and then we can contact you directly. Um, um, regarding those. All right. All righty. Hey Jessica, you want to pause oh, yep. for a few more questions? Oh, sure. Yep. All right. Um, there was a question from Stephen. Uh, why are sub arteries like Hammond Road intersections not coordinated with signals on Roswell Road to effectively move traffic? Interconnected signals are long known answer for this. Um, Caitlin, do you wanna talk a little bit about um, the, the management of traffic signals by the city and what that does? Sure, so we actually, so um, Coordinated signal timing, which is what you're talking about, is something that's been around for a while. The city has actually moved to an even more advanced type of signal timing since then. We do adaptive signal timing, and this has been deployed along Roswell Road, and it's being deployed in other areas of the city as well. And so what this does actually is it takes the real-time traffic volumes and into consideration, and for the next cycle, it will update uh, how much signal timing each movement should get based on real real time volumes. And so it's even more advanced in, than coordination. And also it, it does coordinate with the other signals at the same time. And so uh, you do see that along Roswell Road, it is something that's been a big investment area um, for the city. And so it's being deployed on Hammond, it's being deployed in the perimeter area. And so it's something that we're trying to roll out throughout the city, but um, it takes some time. Thanks, Caitlin. And we have a second question here um, from Colin. Um, Colin's asking about the anticipated influence of autonomous vehicle navigation envisioned by this plan and how ITS anticipates driverless vehicles. And this might be, Caitlin, somewhere where you can talk a little bit about the, about the ITS master plan. Yes, so the ITS master plan was something that we had completed the previous year in, in, in 2019. 
And we, we did discuss how do you plan for autonomous vehicles? And I think one of, there's so many big questions on what this will actually look like. And so what we're trying to do as, as a city and preparing our signals is really just to make sure there's enough bandwidth. And so it's, it's not um, anything super exciting to see on the streets. It's more so the back end. How do we uh, make sure that we, are, we aren't overloading our communications network with too many devices, for example, because these, these vehicles will be able to communicate with our, our signals. Um, our signals will be communicating with uh, buses and even iPhone, even your phone. And so how do we maintain that communication network was kind of the, the key that came out of that and something that we can plan for today. Um, it is something the city is tracking and, and making sure that we're up to date on as, as the industry knows more what that looks like in the future. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, we did get an additional uh, comment about infrastructure recommendations. Um, and so we're actually gonna walk through the online feedback tool at this time and hopefully some of those questions um, may be answered. All right. Uh, so on the screen in front of you is, um, is is what the link takes you to. So you just saw the link in the PowerPoint. This is what what um, the web page that it'll take you to, the landing page. Um, and so I'm just going to walk through each one of these uh, with you all for the moment. Now, um, as soon as you land on the website, um, you're going to land on this page right here where it highlights instructions. And so this instructions page really introduces you to the tool, as well as offers specific instructions on how to proceed with the online feedback tool. It tells you about each of the tabs that you're seeing across the page here and what the tool specifically is asking you to complete as a part of it. It also gives you information regarding the project website and the project email address if you have any additional questions. Um, that's on the bottom here. Um, it also gives you information regarding the project, um, the, excuse me, the top banner in the dark, uh, in the dark blue here is actually something that will ma uh, maintain itself throughout your activity and walking through each of the tool uh, tabs. And so if you um, have any questions regarding the instructions, if you just refer back to this blue tab or the blue um, header here, it'll give you that information. I'll also uh, make a little bit of a plug here. There's a Facebook, Twitter, and a copy link um, button here. There's three buttons in a row. Um, these are uh, just here for you so that it's easier for you all to help to share this tool with your friends, your neighbors, and coworkers. Now, the second tab I'm going to go ahead and click here um, is called your travel habits. And these are just a few optional questions that tell us a little bit more about who you are. Uh, the information and feedback that you provide as a part of this specific tab here is going to be private and anonymized. And so if you want to answer these questions, all you have to do is click within the gray box here. If you click and choose a response um, that helps you categorize, again, um, kind of where you stand on that question. Now, if you scroll all the way down, you're going to have to press submit here. And so there's a submit button. I just wanted to point that out um, as, as y'all kind of go through the tool. Now, the next tab that I'll show you here, we're going to get to specific projects. And so as soon as you click the tab, um, there's going to be a pop up that comes up that reminds you of the instructions again. So you're going to click X in order to get to the specific tool. And again, in case you don't remember all the instructions that you saw on the other tabs, um, there is a small summary here in this gray box on the left side that you'll see. Um, and you can see specific project types as well as how they're presented in the legend in the map, as well as a short description of each of the project types here. Now, um, in order to kind of maneuver around the map, you can use your mouse. As you can see, I'm just kind of scrolling back and forth here. Uh, you can click within the map boundaries and again, um, scroll to see all the projects in the city. You can also zoom in and out of the tool using the scroll button on your mouse. And so um, I'm scrolling here in and out. And if you're using this on your phone, you can use your fingers to zoom in and out similarly to how you would use um, a, a smartphone. Now to look at specific projects, what you're going to do is you're going to click on the colored lines here that represent the projects. And so if you click on this project, I'm showing you all a sample here of a, a multi-use trail on Georgia 400, it'll pop up details regarding that specific project. So things like project name, um, project, uh, the extents, the project type, length, as well as, a, um, well, as well as the project cost. And so it'll tell you some more details in regards to that project. 
Now there are two buttons below here that we want to call your attention to. This is how you leave us feedback. And so this button here, it has a heart on it. This is if you like the project and you want to let us know that, go ahead and press that button. There's also a comment button here. Now, if you click on the comment button, you can actually let us, uh, you can actually submit some extra, um, some extra feedback. Uh, tell us what you think about it, if, we're, if we've missed anything, if you like it, um, whatever you wanna leave us regarding that specific comment, we'll be able to, to receive on our end. Um, and so that's how you give us feedback on each of the projects. Now, if you wanna go back to the master list view, you're gonna click this uh, blue arrow that, that points left here, you're gonna click it, and then it'll take you again to the master project list. Um, you'll see, you know, if you're not a map person, there's an entire list of projects here on the right side that you're gonna be able to scroll back and forth on. So if you wanna look, at, look for specific roadways, if they've been included, um, you can go ahead and access it from that, um, from that way as well. I'm gonna click on the roadway tab here and you'll see it's set up um, basically the same way as bicycling and, and, and walking. So very similar, uh, you're gonna get a pop-up window here, um, see the legend of projects that are included, uh, description of the project types. And then again, you know, if you click through the mapping, um, the mapping site, you can go ahead and pull here and there uh, to look at the distribution of projects, to look at what projects are out there. And here I'm gonna, as a sample, just really click, uh, really quick, click a project. Um, here it's a bridge enhancement on Georgia 400, right on Roberts Drive. And so you can find a little bit more information about each one of these. Again, there's a heart button as well as a comment button for you to, um, to give us some feedback. The third, um, I guess the third project tab here, again, is transit. Um, there are, are just a few projects here in the transit category. And so again, very similar things as you saw in roadway and bicycling and walking. Click on the project, you'll be able to see some more details and let us know what you think. The second to last tab here is the what's missing tab. And so um, this is just a tech, an open text box. If you have any final thoughts or comments or concerns, if you wanna be contacted um, further regarding a specific topic, you can leave us your email and your specific comment here and we'll be able to again, get it on our end. Um, and so here it's an open comment. You can type um, whatever you think is missing. Again, give us your feedback and then click submit at the end. The last tab here is the FAQ tab. We have three specific questions um, that have been answered as a part of this. Um, you know, things from, uh, you know, how will your comments and responses be used as a part of um, this online feedback tool? Uh, what do these recommended projects look like moving forward? As well as um, we mentioned this a little bit earlier, but why aren't current transportation projects, including those that are funded, why aren't they showing up on the map? And so these are some of the questions that we've answered and, and, and offered answers for on the online feedback tool. Again, it'll be available um, through February 18th for you all to give us feedback. So just, just about three weeks that the survey will remain open. All right, and I'm going to actually jump back to the PowerPoint here. Again, just want to remind you all that this is the online feedback tool web address. Kaylin, do you want to take us away for the next steps? Yes, again, I just want to reiterate, thank you everybody for joining us today for our, our presentation and to learn a little bit more about the work we've been doing over the past few months. Um, right now, we're, we're looking for your feedback. So our, like Jessica said, the online survey is open today until February 18th. Please do take a look at the projects, um, the ones that are in your neighborhoods or on the roads that you travel on, or just what you want to envision for the city and provide us feedback, negative, positive, we want to hear it all. So please do uh, submit those comments. Um, we'll be bringing the draft plan to council for adoption in the spring. So once we get those, your, your feedback, we will wrap up our, our final recommendations and, and move that forward. And all of, all the information that you've seen today, as well as the link to the online survey and, and past materials from other presentations are located on the project website. So please do check that out. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me again. I'm Caitlin Schenkel, uh, the transition planner with the city. And you can, you can reach me at tmp at sayingspringsga.gov. Uh, with that, I will hand it back to Jessica to field questions. Um, we do have about seven more minutes. So if anyone has any additional questions, feel free to to uh, add them to the Q&A while we're answering the, the other ones. 
All right. Um, I'm actually going to uh, revisit a comment that we received regarding infrastructure recommendations for, for electric scooters and bicycles, for example. Um, and so a lot of our recommendations um, regarding electric scooters and e-bikes specifically are largely policy related. Um, again, you know, we, we haven't seen a lot of e-scooters um, in on the network for the city just yet. And so um, being able to kind of look at a micromobility policy citywide is probably the first step in, 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 in really addressing some of those concerns that you may have. And so, um, Caitlin, is there anything else that you wanna add there? No, I think that's, again, like you said, really the driving force behind having a micromobility policy is taking the, the opportunity to research what the best infrastructure recommendations would be um, in order to formalize that into policy. So uh, we'll be looking at that hopefully in the next few years. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you, Colin. <laughs> All right, if y'all have any other questions, please feel free to put them in. Um, oh, we got a question from David. Are e-scooters permitted in Sandy Springs currently? Uh, Caitlin, do you wanna give a little bit of a, a background on where y'all are? Yeah, so we, we follow state law. And so um, based on how the state law views scooters, I, th I think they're currently allowed in the roadway. And so um, whatever state law dictates is, is what we follow. We also have some regulations in regards to where you can you can park things in the right of way, and so uh, you can't just leave a, a scooter line around based on our code. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, we got a question from Anne. Um, Anne asks, "Has there been any discussion about a pedestrian walkway on Roswell Road over 285?" All right. Caitlin, do you want to talk through anything about Roswell Road specifically on 285? Um, I know, so there's currently sidewalk out there. It's probably not the ideal sidewalk, but one of the recommendations from the plan is to take a, a deeper look at the intersection or the intersections with the ramps. And so as part of that study, I'm sure pedestrian uh, facilities will be part of that. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, there was a question regarding if uh, this pr a presentation will be available, um, all the content from this meeting as well as recordings will be available on the, uh, the TMP website. So just wanted to reiterate that for everybody. And the, the video is being recorded and so it would be probably be posted tomorrow morning. So it might be a little bit of delay, but the rest of the material should be up by later tonight. All right, we have a couple more minutes uh, left before the end of the hour. Um, any other questions that you all want to ask, um, please type into the Q&A. Uh, oh, I, so I think that's all we, we have time for today. Um, thank you again, everyone. Really appreciate your time. It's I know these, these virtual meetings get a little, a little too much, especially with everyone's having a lot of screen time these days. So we really, really appreciate you tuning in and uh, really are excited to see any kind of feedback you can provide us. So thank you and have a good night.